I'd like to welcome everybody to the West Virginia Archives Library, uh, our lecture for tonight. I would like to remind everybody there is some upcoming lectures. Uh, on the June 26th, we have African American Life in Charleston, A Personal Perspective by uh, Thomas Tyree. And that is uh, one of the, our, uh, the uh, block speaker series. There's going to be uh, several uh, several speakers over the next couple months that are associated with that uh, series. On uh, July 1st, Time's Running Out, a historical perspective of a movie and the fight against southern West Virginia forest fires by Robert Bean Blossom and Richard Foss. Our very own Dick Foss back here in the corner. <clears throat> the Riverine World by uh, Gerald Sutton will be on July 17th. And on July 24th, African American Life in Charleston, A Personal Perspective. These are the, the uh, lock speaker series again. Charles H. James will be the speaker for that night. <clears throat> Tonight, Carter Taylor Seaton will present Hippie Homesteaders, Arts, Crafts, Music, and Living on the Land in West Virginia. In the, eight, in the 1960s, the Vietnam War was raging and protests were erupting across the United States. In many quarters, young people were dropping out of society, leaving their urban homes behind in an attempt to find a, per a safe place to live on their own terms. To grow their own food and to avoid a war, they passionately decried. During this time, West Virginia became, becomes a haven for thousands of these homesteaders back to the landers as they were termed by some, or hippies as others called them. A significant number remain to this day. Some were artisans when they arrived, while others adopted a craft when they, that provided them with the cash necessary to survive. Carter spent two years researching and interviewing people to write hippie homesteaders. Tonight she will explain the movement and tell the stories of a few of the 40 artisans and musicians who came to the state, lived on the land, and created successful careers with their craft. Carter will also discuss the serendipitous timing of this influx, the community and economic support these crafters received from residents and state agencies in West Virginia, and why she believes that without these young transplants, there might be no Tamarack, the best of West Virginia, or Mountain Stage. In addition to hippie homesteaders, Carter is the author of two novels, Father's Troubles in 2004, and Emma, no, An Unconventional Love Story in 2011. Numerous magazine articles and several essays and short stories. From 1971 to 1985, she directed the Appalachian Craftsman Incorporated, a rural craft cooperative. Carter was nominated for the Ladies Home Journal Women of the Year 1975 award and has run three marathons, Atlanta, New York City, and the Marine Corps since turning 50. A graduate of Marshall University, she is also a ceramic sculptor living in Huntington. Please welcome Carter. Thank you all so much for coming and thank you for that nice introduction. I appreciate it. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, Two of my subjects are in the audience, and Greg said he was here to defend himself. <laughs> so uh, I will refer to them later, but I wanted to tell you a little bit about this. Um, I guess it's a phenomenon, is the way I would term it. It's a part of West Virginia's history that nobody's ever written about until now. And um, when I discovered it, I was at the Mountain State Art and Craft Fair where I had spent 15 years, roughly, um, as part of Appalachian Craftsman. I was there to sell the work that our rural artisans were making, and also there were a whole lot of artisans who, as I like to say, didn't have the same accent that those <laughs> that I've been working with had. They sounded just a little different. They might have had a Midwestern accent, or a New York accent, or a Brooklyn accent. But they certainly didn't sound like the West Virginia Hill people that I knew. 
And I never really asked that question as to why they were there. Nobody did. We just were busy trying to sell our stuff, you know? Um, that, was, that was the name of the game. We were there from nine to nine and working ourselves to death. And um, yet they were what I would have called back then stereotypically a hippie. They, many of them were in working stocks and tie-dye shirts and had long hair and some of them had earrings. And they just didn't look like the lady, you know, who was stirring the, the last soap. <laughs> you know, just not quite the same. Um, and these are the people that I went back to when I started thinking about why they came. Um, a friend of mine asked that question, and I said, well, you know, I never really asked anybody why they were here. They just, they just were. But I'd maintained friendships with several of them, including Rick McDowell, who was one of my real close friends. So I called up Rick, and we went to see him, his friend and I, and I asked him that question. And he said, well, you know, I think it probably had something to do with, you know, the, the Vietnam War and people who were tired, all of that stuff. And I thought, hmm, that's interesting. So I decided I would start looking into that, into why that was truly the case. Now, I knew about the Appalachian arts and crafts tradition and had known it for years, um, even though I had considered myself an urban Appalachian, I knew that that was a part of West Virginia's tradition. Uh, the music, certainly, and the arts and crafts, because I'd been going to the fair for all those length of time. And I knew I'd taken a sociology class from a guy in Huntington who talked all about the influx of that in the 17 and 1800s and how it was you know, what we look at as pioneer crafts, how they were, they knew how to, you know, split logs and make baskets and um, cut shingles and do whatever was necessary to survive. Certainly the women sewed and I knew all about quilting and how that tradition had started. But I never kind of put that together with this. Um, and I learned later when I started looking into it that, um, that sort of marked us, it, while it was good for us in one way, we, we maintained a heritage, it marked Appalachia as backward because by the time that the re Industrial Revolution had occurred, um, people were now buying the, hand, the, the stuff that they could buy at the store or from the traveling salesman who would come with his little wagon, you know. Well, the wagon didn't make it into West Virginia usually because the roads were so bad, it was just basically inaccessible in many areas. So that, that's why it stayed in our state. That's why Appalachia, particularly the rural Appalachia, uh, maintained this heritage of arts and crafts and doing things by themselves. And it really, that whole appreciation for arts and crafts waxed and waned throughout the 1900s. Um, it was better in some periods of time, and then it dropped off again during the Depression. And in the 1960s, we saw a revival of that. And that's when Appalachian Craftsman was born in the early 1970s, late 1960s, early 1970. That's when Cabin Creek was formed, and a number of those craft cooperatives, not just in West Virginia, but all over the, the Appalachian region. And lo and behold, it was something that was now in vogue again, to buy things that were handcrafted. And that's why the fair was taken off and doing so well, because the state had decided that they could make some money by selling arts and crafts. So in West Virginia, we had four major craft cooperatives, Appalachian Craftsmen in Huntington and the surrounding four or five counties. Here, there was Cabin Creek Quilts and Mountain Artisans. And in Parkersburg, there was Rural Arts and Crafts. And there, you know, there's one in Tennessee called Redbird Mission. And they were all over the place. Um, and that lasted for most all of us about 15 to maybe 20 years. Now, what missed us, besides the wagon with all the store-bought goodies, was this, the upheaval that was happening all over the country. We really, you know, we saw it on television, of course, but there wasn't a whole lot of participation with that here in this country. First of all, I mean, in this state, first of all, we have a history of, um, of a large number of young people going to the selective service. So you didn't see a whole lot of people here protesting the Vietnam War. 
even though it was on our screens and a lot of people were unhappy about it. There wasn't a lot of protests like there were in the big schools. This was Columbia University in 1968. Now, the reason that that became such a, an upheaval was kind of a whole national phenomenon. First of all, in 1963, John F. Kennedy had been killed. People were disheartened about that. And, and uh, then LBJ got in there, and we had you know, the Vietnam War began to escalate. And uh, then in 68, Martin Luther King was killed, and then and Bobby Kennedy were killed. All of those people died at that time. And they called 1968 the year the dream died. And the reason <clears throat> was because the kids finally said, we've had it. You know, we've protested, we've marched, we've tried to take over Washington, we've done everything we can think of, and it hadn't changed. And now we've got Nixon, of all people, in the 70s, who was making matters worse. So they said, that's it. I, I can't do it anymore. I'm leaving. I'm, I'm out of here. I don't like the way the environment's going. I don't like the materialism in the cities. I don't like the pollution, I don't like the war. I want to go someplace where I feel safe and someplace where I can grow my own food and live my way. <laughs> Frank Sinatra, do it my way. And so they dropped out. And most of these were kids of some, some privilege at least, middle class and upper. And um, I've heard some of them called trust fund babies. You know, they had money coming from their their parents. Well, a lot of them also didn't cash those checks. They got them, but they tore them up. Um, but they wanted to do it on their own. And one thing I discovered, which I thought was really unusual, is that many of the people that I interviewed were middle children. Now, I don't know if that's got anything to do with anything, but those ten, you know, the oldest kid usually mark, you know, toes the line, and the baby is just kind of not bothering, but the middle kid is usually the one who decides he's going to do it his own way. Uh, it certainly was that way in my family. My, my son, was, my middle son, is always the independent one of the, of the group. Um, and so these kids started dropping out of college. Either they finished college and then bolted and said, I'm not going to take a normal job and I'm not going to live like my parents did. I'm going to go someplace else. Or they left before they graduated. Also in 1970, the murders, the shootings at Kent State were another factor. And so they, they took off. And how did they find us? Why us? Now it happened in lots of other places, but I'm here to tell you that it happened more here than almost every other state. And part of the reason, I believe, and this is just me, I believe it's LBJ's fault. Because when he started showing West Virginia as the poster child for poverty. He not only showed the kid on the front porch, he showed that. And people said, well, that looks like some place that I could survive. I could live, I could be there, and if the world goes to hell in a handbasket, I'm safe. It's up in the mountains, and probably nobody's going to bother me. They don't even know I'm there. Excuse me. <coughs> So they decided to go to West Virginia. It was beautiful, and on top of that, there was an article in a magazine called Mother Earth News that said one person in Lincoln County had bought land for $29 an acre. I don't know what land's going for today. I'm pretty sure it's not $29 an acre. Um, during this same period, we had another phenomenon going on. Like I said, Whoops. Nope. Oh, okay. Here we go. Let me, let me point out to you if you can see enough of that map to tell the hash mark lines in the counties are where many of them settled. They seem to be the most heavily, um, predominantly, uh, where the people moved to. Greenbrier County, Monroe, some in McDowell, Lincoln. Um, a little bit in Kanawha, Roan, all up in there, in Pocahontas, Randolph, Webster, and over in the Eastern Panhandle. And if you notice where they're not, it's not the coal mining communities. They're all in places where they can plant a garden and live on the land. That was the big deal. They wanted to live on the land. 
Okay, so at the same time, we have another phenomenon going on in West Virginia, and that was from the Department of Commerce. The Department, the Department of Commerce had figured out that they had studied some European models and had figured out that crafts in Europe equaled tourism. They were looking for a way to draw tourists to the state of West Virginia because we had a centennial coming up. They wanted to have, what they said was that their idea was to have 100 events on that 100th birthday, and all of them had to feature in some capacity crafts. So they sent this man, John Page, out to look for craftsmen. And he traveled all over the state, he and two or three other people who worked with the Department of Commerce back then. And he said he took a map and he took a green magic marker and when he crossed a road, he marked it so that he wouldn't cross that one again. He would take out every single little tiny hallway he could find to look for these artisans. And of course he found them. He found them all over the place. He found them um, in all those counties I just showed you. Now, he not only found what he was looking for, which he thought were going to be the typical artisan that, you know, that I've worked with, the little old ladies who were making quilts and baskets and what have you, because they'd been bugging the Department of Commerce, I mean, cult agriculture, about selling their stuff at the state fairs. And the Department of uh, Agriculture said, no, that's for food. You can't sell your crafts there. So he knew that there were at least those people out there. Well, lo and behold, what he found on top of all of this were a whole bunch of babies. He found those traditional artists, but he also found new people. Now, those were these kids that I've been talking about. They had come here um, for a whole variety of reasons. Some came because it was beautiful, some came because they wanted someplace safe, some claimed just simply because it was cheap, some came by word of mouth because somebody else invited them. Um, and once they came, he latched onto them. And he said, we've got this big fair that's coming up, and would, I'll pay you, you can pay Brian Van Nostrum to come. Paid his way, paid his booth fee, paid everything. He said, if you'll come, and show, you know, we'll pay your way. Well, Brian thought he was going to make a mint. But to him, $400 was a mint. You know, that was a lot of money back then. And so that's Brian Van Nosher, by the way. He is one of the best known potters in the state. His pots were given this spring as the presents or the gifts that were given uh, to the awards for the governor's uh, achievements in the arts. The other, the lady on that side is Connie McCauley and she's a basket maker. I'll tell you a little bit about her in a little bit. So the, uh, Brian came and he was very pleased. He made a lot of money and he was there for a number of years. I even had a, a tip next to him for a couple of years. Um, and, and that wasn't all they did. They provided um, opportunities for them, these artisans to go to wholesale store, wholesale, wholesale gift shows all across the country. They opened right across the hall what was then called the Shop of the Cultural Center, very clever name, and, um, and, and they put their work in there and they sold it for it. Um, that ultimately then led to the girl who ran it, go over to Tamarack, and Tamarack opened, and most of the people whose work was right here in the very beginning are those people who were the first people during in the Tamarack. So in this case, we have one person who knew how to do his craft when he came. He was college trained as a potter. Connie, on the other hand, just wanted to farm. And she wanted to live someplace that was as far away from civilization as she could possibly get. She wanted someplace where she couldn't see city lights and she couldn't hear anything except the sounds of nature. And so they moved a couple of times till they found that. But she also learned that they needed to have some money for things like tools and, you know, garden carts and things like that. And they met a man who made baskets. 
And he was a traditional basket maker. And he taught Connie and Tom how to make baskets. And they took off with it. They made the typical egg basket for a while, but then they began to go to some of these uh, workshops that the, culture, that the Department of um, Commerce and the Department of Education would hold at Cedar Lakes, and they learned new ways to do things. And suddenly, their baskets took off and became much more sculptural. And eventually, they were sold at a price that nobody at the fair could have afforded. They were in the $2,000 range, and they were put in the Smithsonian Institute. Now, they worked themselves out of a job, unfortunately, but they made enough money that they could basically retire on their baskets. They had a basket school for a number of years and taught a lot of people how to make baskets. But that's an example of how the two cultures blended together, the new culture, the new kids coming in, and the old culture that was already here, and how they enhanced it. Uh, how it made a difference in the way we view crafts and carried on a tradition. Uh, and what else I thought was really interesting in learning all about all of this is that almost every single artisan that I've talked to had a couple like that that adopted them. Had somebody that they could tell me their names and where they lived and what they did and how they saved them from starvation or freezing to death. You know, there was always that couple, that older couple, and they had sort of a shared relationship in terms of, I'll do work for you if you'll help me do such and such. Or they teach them how to plant, because they came with, you know, their book called Living the Good Life, telling them how to plant, or Mother Earth News. And, you know, it was, you, know, you can't exactly learn all that stuff from a book. I used to think you could learn anything by reading a book. I'm not sure you can. I think you have to have a little bit of innate help from somebody. So they um, they can tell me who saved their lives, so to speak. And the reason that was important, and the reason I believe that they adopted them, is if you remember, if you're from here and you know what happened in the 50s, we had a huge out migration of young people. They went to the cities. They were doing exactly the opposite of what these kids were doing just about 10 years earlier. They'd gone to Columbus or um, someplace in Tennessee, maybe Knoxville. They'd gone to Charlotte or Detroit or wherever it was because they were sick and tired of living on the land and you know, grubbing for their food and having to do all that. They wanted what they thought was wonderful in the big cities. So here come these kids to say, well, we think it's cool. Will you show us what to do? And they took the place, literally, of these kids. And there was some, so one of the girls, I think, told me that she thought there was a little bit of resentment from the, the kids that they'd now taken sort of center stage in their family's hearts, so to speak, because they shared the same values and they shared the same interests and they needed each other and suddenly these kids were all someplace else and they were just visitors they weren't they weren't they weren't farmers anymore and these kids were this is one of the most interesting guys i think this is a man named joe Lund. he came here came here to west virginia from missouri but by way of china Joe is Chinese, his name is Joe Lung. I'm sure Joe is not his initial name, his original name. And um, he is, he, they had to flee China because his father was a general with Chiang Kai-shek's army. So they went to Formosa. And in the process, one of his younger brothers died. So they lived in Formosa for a number of years and his parents always wanted him to get a better education than they could provide in, in Japan or in, I mean in China or in Formosa. And they sent him to the United States to school. And he went to the University of Missouri. And they wanted him to be an engineer. And Joe uh, didn't want to be an engineer. He graduated with that and took a job and was bored out of his mind. And he went back to school, but as soon as he got the chance to really be free of his parents, you know, paying the bills, 
he dropped engineering as quickly as he could, and he went back to doing art, which was his major love. And he wanted to be a painter, and that's what he does now. But when he figured out that he couldn't make much money being a, pot, a painter, he went to pottery. And um, he came to West Virginia because his wife wanted to join a commune. She'd been at Kent State uh, during the shootings there, and she wanted to leave again, leave and come to a commune that she knew in West Virginia. So Joe followed her, and uh, that marriage eventually split up, but they were there in the commune for a number of months, not very long, it was about the end of it. And Joe says that it kind of dissolved because it didn't have a central um, tenet of belief. Um, I've learned from talking to many of these people that communes were not as idealistic as we kind of think they were. Um, that if there wasn't some central belief that held everybody together, they tended to just kind of fall apart. Um, and that's what happened to Joe's. But he rented a farmhouse, and he's actually still in the same farmhouse that he was in. Um, and he went to do it in And he was a real standout at Ripley because he definitely didn't look like anybody else there, you know. And neither did his work. You can see it's porcelain, it's very fine, it's very delicate, and that's very Oriental art on it. And that's the way he, um, he made most of his pottery and sold a lot of it. Um, I want to be sure to stop and say that not everybody who came to West Virginia was an artisan, nor did they take that up. Because if I were to try and encompass everybody who came and everybody who stayed, I would include doctors and environmental lawyers and people who work in the state archives and musicians and midwives and social workers and teachers. They're everywhere. They run hotels, they run B&Bs, they run restaurants. And you'd just be amazed at how many others are here still. It's estimated that about a million people at one time went back to the land. That's a bunch of people. Now, they didn't all stay. And some of the people I've talked to guessed that maybe 10, 5% stayed in West Virginia. But that's 5% out of 10,000. We roughly had 10,000 translates come to this state. And you can learn that by looking at the census figures because that's the only time in five decades that we had an increase in population. And it didn't come to COVID. One person asked me that, so I researched it to make sure. Yes, we had an upswing in production of, of uh, mining at that time, but that was because of mechanization. The number of people working in the mines had gone down tremendously. So it came for some other reason, and about 10,000 of them were these people. So they, land, they landed virtually everywhere. Um, so speaking of musicians, this is probably one of the best known <laughs> groups around. Now, this picture on my right is um, of the farm family. And I bet the two people sitting in about the <laughs> four front back could identify every single one of them. I can't, except for the guy right in the middle with his mouth open, and that's Ron Um Who else is in there, Sandy? Do you see him? Greg's in the very back. Okay. Jack Collins and There's a bunch. All right, so they came to uh, Putnam County, and they came, I, I think the first week for a while they came to visit Greg Carroll. <laughs> Greg's grandfather owned land there, and he had moved to that spot. And somebody, was it Bob Webb or... One of them, I don't sure. know. Yeah, came to visit him and never went home. They never left. And so then they called up a bunch of their buddies or wrote to a bunch of their buddies and said, you know, this is a really cool place. Why don't y'all come? Now, it turned out that some of the people knew each other either in New Orleans or in Texas or a variety of other places where they had worked as musicians in the past. And Ron and Sandy were ones that had known Steve Hill from musical. Um, gigs in, in other places. 
I think mostly in New Orleans, but they all eventually came, and you know, two here, three there, whatever, and they formed what they called the family, the farm. And they didn't live communally, but it was sort of an intentional community. And the intention was that they would grow food and you know, play music. <laughs> that was sort of the intention. Steve Hill, who uh, was with the Pickers for a number of years, uh, built a house that's octagonal. And he lived there for five years without, even though he had electricity, he didn't hook it up because he wanted to prove that he could live that way in case all hell broke loose. Now, I think that's pretty sacrificial and remarkable, you know? They had a community building that they all hung out in, and they would play music. Pick, pick, they all of them played guitar or some stringed instrument. So they sort of called themselves pickers. So one day, I guess um, Steve Hill's wife invited them to come and play at the Mountain State Art and Craft Fair at a booth called Yesteryear Toy Company. Does anybody remember that group besides me? Okay. Well, they were a huge success. And they hadn't even given themselves a name at that point. Um, and then Jim Andrews from the Department of Culture and History found them, walked up across the swinging bridge and up the hill to find them, and he put them in a showcase here at the Cultural Center to provide, um, to, to pick people who would then go out into the schools and do residencies. And the pickers did that. And um, Sandy was one of the pickers. She was the, the chick singer with the pickers. And um, they became so well known, they were really the hottest thing in, in music in West Virginia for what, nine years? Nine years. Um, and Sadie says that they did a great job with music, but that they were some of the stupidest pioneers that ever hit West Virginia. So, uh, as they say, the rest is history. Now, many of those people on that um, picture on your my, my left um, are members of the Mountain Stage Band, and that's a whole other story that I think probably would, um, contribute, has contributed to a tremendous amount of Mountain Stage's success. This is a couple named Steve and Gail Balcourt, and they made candles. Now, they're from Long Island, and they got married before they came to West Virginia because Steve said the people down there didn't cotton the people living together without being married. So they got married before they came, and um, they lived on a ridge top in Braxton County for 14 years without running water, and they cooked with a cook stove, and heated their house that way with a pot belly stove. They grew almost every, literally everything they ate. The only thing they bought, I think, was sugar. And they lived that way for 14 years. Their daughter, Ruthie, says she cannot look beet soup in the face because <laughs> they had to eat it so often. And that they, uh, the kids ate sausage literally every day for lunch. And one of my favorite stories that they told me was of trying to um, slaughter a hog by reading the textbook as to how to slaughter a hog. It's propped, they have a picture of themselves, it's propped in the kitchen window, and they're, you know, doing it over the kitchen sink, trying to slaughter this hog. Uh, sadly, that picture is not in the book. I didn't <laughs> give me that one. But they're remarkable people because they managed to survive so long. The two kids up there on that mountaintop, and the stories of her uh, when she's pregnant with the second child, which is Ruthie, uh, getting down off the mountain and finding that the car, the truck battery had been borrowed, and they had to figure out how to get to Charleston to deliver this baby or pretty heroin. That and the time that's, that a tree fell on, on Steve. So it's a, they're a remarkable couple. This is a couple who came here uh, to build their own, to do a pottery. They were both um, potters, V.C. Dibble and his wife, Damien. Now, Damien still lives here in Charleston. V.C. is dead, but Damien still lives here. She is no longer doing pottery, but she is a jeweler. Um, and they 
to me, are a good example of someone who really worked hard to pass their skills on to someone else because he was one of the most popular people to be apprenticed to when you were at Ripley. If you wanted to do pots, you wanted to be sure that you got hooked up with VC. He, and they taught a lot of workshops, they had a lot of apprentices who came and worked at Kiln Ridge Pottery with them and became well known in and of themselves. Um, so they, they are a good example of somebody who intentionally came here uh, because they heard about it and they wanted to live in the Now This is another close to home story. This is the folks at Cabin Creek Quilts. That picture on the top on my right is Cabin Creek back in the 1960s. And I fear when it rains and it's wintry, it doesn't look a whole lot better now. Um, the guy who is in the bottom of his dog, Tripper, is a man named Jamie, now, now known as James, t -Bow. James was the, um, the VISTA volunteer who came here and he'd been, he came from um, outside of Boston, okay? He, his, he visited a family. This is how, how different his life was once he came. His summer retreat was at a friend's house in a com on a compound next to the Kennedys on High Abbotsport. And when he came here, it was just a bit of culture shock. He chose Cabin Creek because he thought this, the name of it sounded interesting and picturesque. And that's what he saw when he got here. Um, so he was, he was tasked with doing a clean water study. But when he got here, he encountered the women who said, I don't care about you doing a clean water study. It's lousy water and we know it. You don't need to do a study to tell us. What we want you to do is to sell our quilts. We make quilts. We know you're from someplace that'll buy them. We want you to sell. He went to his boss and, and you know, his supervisor at Vista, and they said, no, we're not doing that. We're not starting another co-op. They've done them all over the country, and they just don't work. So he went back and he told them that, and they said, I'm oh, sorry. We don't care what your boss says. This is what we want you to do. Take those quilts and go to Boston and try and sell them. And sure enough, he did. And eventually it became Cabin Creek Quilts. And uh, he sold them to Jackie Kennedy. He sold them all over the country. And when Colleen Anderson came to work in the same Vista project, um, he and Colleen lived in that little shack. Okay? Now that's not the worst place that, that is the worst place they lived, but they said that that was the shackiest of all the places that they lived. Uh, this is Colleen down in the middle. See the short-haired girl with the glasses? That's Colleen. And Jamie is over here with the, uh, the Beatles look and the hat. They um, one day took, decided to take the quilts to New York City. Oh, Colleen, by the way, tried five times to quit before she finally gave in and said, all right, I'm staying. She kept going to her supervisor saying, I can't do this, I can't do this. And they said, well, just try it for another week. And so eventually she stayed. Um, they went to New York with a whole bunch of quilts, and they rented a hotel room, and they were going to have a show. And they had sent out invitations to all these buyers from Saks Fifth Avenue, from Bond with Taylor, Lord and Taylor, all these big places, right? Nobody came. Not a single soul showed up. So they're thinking, well, let's see. Now what do we do? We've got all these quilts. We've got this time. We've got this room. We're supposed to be selling these quilts. We've got to figure out some way. We can't go back and tell these people we didn't sell them. So Jamie said, okay, let's do this. He put the quilts over top of the van. Big folks with your van, okay? And he tied them all down, and he drove down Fifth Avenue in New York City with these van covered in quilts. Parked in front of one of the hotels, I mean, one of the stores that they were trying to get sold, trying to get the stuff sold to. And Colleen's task was to go upstairs, find the buyer, tell her, make her look out the window. Well, by the time that happened, and they looked out the window, the cops were there, the uh, TV stations were there, the newspaper was there, and they had this huge hullabaloo of what was going on with all these nutcases running around New York with quilts tied to their, to their vans. But they got the business that they were looking for. 
So um, those two were quite enterprising, and uh, that co that cooperative lasted for at least 20 years, if not longer. And um, they they did Jamie did some other really unusual things in Malden, and he um, was involved in getting uh, Booker T. Washington's <coughs> home restored, and and the women in the craft cooperative. Eventually, they owned all this property and they gave it all to um, the state so that it could become a historic, situ a historic landmark. Okay, so here we arrive at Mountain Stage. To me, the legacy of all of this is not just the fact that it's a wonderful historic part of West Virginia's history. It, there's a legacy that came from this. And one of those, I believe, is Mountain Stage. The two guys, Andy Ridenour and Larry Gross, neither one of those are West Virginia natives either, not born here. Larry came on an MEA grant to do a fellowship uh, in some of the schools. He was a well-known musician, a songwriter, and Andy came to go to Glenville College. And they met, teamed up, and dreamed up the idea of Mountain Stage. And as they say, the rest is history. 35 years later, it's the what is it, the longest running performance radio program on national public radio. Right here. And of course, they've gone all over the place with that show as well as being here and broadcast. And now it's um, telecast as well as being broadcast. And um, many of Putnam County Pickers are right there in the house band. And I also studied all the other people who are on that house band. There's not a single one of them that's a native of West Virginia. Not one. Not Bob Thompson. Not uh, not the singers. You know, not none of them that are up there on a regular basis. And then here's the other thing. Tamara. I gave you a little bit of the history of how that began. Um, but Gaston Caperton was the brains behind it. And one of the guys that I met, that I talked to, his name is Joe Chasnall, and he had met Gaston at some function uh, when he was trying to sell these tables and so forth. And Governor Caperton said to him, you know, are there a lot of you guys around? I mean, I see several people who are doing this. Do he said, you wouldn't believe how many Gaston. They're all over the state. And so that encouraged him to continue with his dream of making some show place in the state of West Virginia. Uh, and many of the people who were the very people I've just been talking about were the initial people who were juried into town. They were either eventually on the first board of directors or they made something that's a part of the sculptural um, architecture of that building. They either did the handles that you notice some of the metal handles, those are all hand forged. All the stained glass is done by some West Virginia artisan. Um, the, the sign right on the side of the door, right on the side of the wall, as you walk in, it's got all those hands. That's made by a man named Bill Hoban, who lives in Sutton and came here from, oh, I think he came here from Missouri, but he lived somewhere else before that. Um, and he had he'd been a protester and all of the whole, whole nine yards and had gone back in the land. Um, he's also got a sculpture or two up there as well. Um, Don Page as well was on the initial board of directors and the first uh, director was uh, Rebecca Stelling who was the beginning of the shop here at the Cultural Center. So you can see how it has evolved over the years and how this whole movement did much more than just give sales to a bunch of craftsmen and musicians. It made, in my mind, it made our state different. Thank you.
And then, after a while, he was having to commute outside the city to New Rochelle. And it was just, the, the commuting was just gruesome. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, well, everybody else from New York and every other place is going back to West Virginia. <laughs> so let's do the same thing. Why don't we go back to West Virginia? No. So we ended up in Elkin. Mm -hmm. And there was a huge back to the land movement right. in Elkin, in Randolph County. And um, for your next book, what I want to read about <laughs> is the, pop, the political side mm -hmm. of all of us. We were highly, highly political. And I had just come from marching down Fifth Avenue in New York City mm -hmm. for the women's movement. And it was, a, believe it or not, we got down to Elkin, and it was a seamless uh, trip because there was the Elkins women's group. And we were highly political there. I mean, we've done all kinds of things. Now, I, want, I, I know that when I went out to visit all these people, I, I didn't see a single George Bush for president's today. <laughs> <laughs> no. Very liberal group. Uh, and it always makes me wonder how we became a red state. You know? and because the, there's a the, whole lot of them. The, the, the politics, the, the, the most intensive politics was environmental. Yes. Very. I went to, um, while we were there living in Elvis, we lived in a farm outside of town, 25 acres, bought it for $6,000 or something. But I went to a meeting because there was uh, the, the uh, blasting from the strip mine was an impacting a fish hatchery. <laughs> was right outside of Elkins. And a man who saw the Potomac, who lived in Washington, D.C., stood up and made this impassioned speech about what the Potomac looks like mm -hmm. now. And he cried. Wow. He said, he said, please, I do beg you to do something about this. And um, as I said, that we, we had an alternative newspaper. It was called Backcountry. Mm -hmm. And someone eventually um, that went to WVU did a master's thesis on Backcountry. Um, and we had poetry. We had all kinds of political statements in it. Mm -hmm. And um, I look back on it very fondly. Mm -hmm. It was a wonderful time. And how I actually physically got here, you got you got that right, although I was from here. Mm -hmm. wasn't from Elvis, but I had a friend who um, said, I mean, we just dropped out. My husband had a very lucrative job. He was, you know, he was working in New York City for a big radio station. And my friend said, come on down, and I'll get you a house. And that's what we did. Mm -hmm. And the most interesting chapter, I'll just say one more thing, the most interesting chapter, to me was the way we were accepted in Elkins. <coughs> this was a wonderful thing. We had a neighbor we had never planted before, and he taught us to plant by the signs. Yeah. He told us about the posy lady and all that, you know, all that sort of thing. And he took us into his way, and, you know, he had spent his whole life there in Elkins. And it, it really was true. They, they just took us, took us in. You know, what was so amazing, um, what, what I found interesting as well, was that, that that surprised the people that I talked to. You know, they said, one guy, Chuck Wilderstock, because he's one of the news in Brown County, and he said, all these people took up, they took him under their wing. He said they would go, you know, help me pull my truck out if it got stuck in the mud, or they'd take care of my kids when I had to go to a craft fair or whatever it took, and they just did it. It wasn't, you know, I didn't even have to ask them. It's just the way they were. And they were stunned because I think they expected, you know, a different reaction. You're a bunch of long-haired hippies, so to speak, and, you know, what, do you, what in the world are you all doing in our state, you know? And that didn't happen at all. And, you know, there might have been some who thought their kid would be influenced by these horrible pot smokers, but, you know, that wasn't the norm at all. It was most of the people who were very well accepted and integrated right into the communities. Thank you.
Yes. I was going to say a few things. Uh, our situation there in Putnam County was unique in many ways, but one of the things is, is that I have the best of both worlds. I'm raised in Texas, in Fort Worth, and my grandfather was from Putnam County. Mm -hmm. So I spent every summer in Putnam County living for three months in a backwoods area that had a fabulous garden and we didn't have electricity at first, but my grandfather eventually got that and he wanted to watch Dolly Parton on TV, so he finally put up a big antenna, you know, put up a big antenna and watch gun smoke, you know. But the situation there was that I spent all those summers yeah. in an extremely rural environment, but I went home and lived in the suburbs and played football and, you know, literally that kind of experience. Mm -hmm. So when I came back to West Virginia, it was not a mystery or a new thing uh -huh. or whatever, you know. Right. But uh, it's amazing that Sandy is also from Fort Worth, for instance, as an example, but we didn't know each other in Fort Worth. We found each other in Putnam <laughs> County, rural Putnam <laughs> County, and uh, everybody fell in love with the romantic image of wilderness. And that's a very important notice to think that these city kids were raised romantically. And that romantic image was the same for the peace movement or for the civil rights movement. Everybody should treat each other equally or everybody should be, you know, for peace and that's what the Christian movement says and that's what the whatever. The other thing I want to say is, is that we also are different in the sense that the reason we still live there on the farm is because we did not have a central religious and or political entity that made everybody either alienated if you don't follow this rule or not. So different than what you said yeah, is different. the reality yeah. that our diversity has kept us all there, and that's 40 years. Yeah, that, that is different. different. But we weren't really a true come, maybe for a couple of months. <laughs> for several maybe years, we had meetings. Months. We had meetings. Okay, we had meetings. We were fighting all But that. true commune <laughs> shares money. Yeah. And although we did know, this is Pat Dawson, and she was one of the original members of the farm also. And, you know, and she, she you know, um, but uh, I totally agree with Greg in that I, I'm amazed that we're still there. Mm -hmm. And it does have to do with the fact that we, you know, didn't. Well, I think it has to do with partly also because you didn't live communally. You know, yeah. In some cases, that so, was the case. And so you still had your independence. It's a little bit like Greg and having, you know, two worlds. You all had the best of both. We share some things. We share some land. Yes. If, you know, we share some land. You know, we, uh, but um, yeah, so it, it, it uh, and, and I always tell people that the success of the farm uh, has to do with the fact that we have somehow managed to cut each other enough slack. Yeah. <laughs> that we're still friends. Yeah, we're still friends. Well, Judith Vendor told me that, uh, you know, she can, she brought a whole commune of people here to West Virginia. And um, I don't know if you know who Judy is, but if you go to festival in her seat, you'll see her. She's the little tiny sprite lady with the face with the face mask on. She's on all of her ads. Um, that's Judy Bender. Well, Judy came here from New York um, because she wanted to build a community school that would teach children the way she thought her child should be taught and wasn't being where she was living then, which was in Texas. And um, she, she rounded up a whole bunch of her friends and said, I'm moving to West Virginia, come with me. And they did. Now, she said that fell apart over a bunch of rules. You know, she said, I can remember sitting arguing over whether or not we should grind the millet or not. You know, I mean, really silly stuff like that. But the big issue was when a lot of people started flocking to the commune and they were having children. Well, she said, if we have to raise these children communally, then we should have the right to say you can or can't have them. Because if we can't take care of a whole flock of kids, we don't want you to either come with them 
or have them once you get here. And that, you know, pretty much sealed the deal. They were over that, you know. They didn't want to be told what to do. And eventually it all just drifted away and only two people remained, and that's Jude and Frank Vicenzi, her partner. Uh, but she did get her school built and she does teach in Calvin County. Yep, in Calvin County. She teaches, uh, it's called Heartwood in the Hills, and she teaches movement and dance and self-expression and <coughs> self-confidence and mask making oh, and wonderful stuff um, to children and adults. So there are success stories out of communes that fall apart you know, as well. Any other questions or statements? Yes. Um, I realize that you're talking about the people who came here and stayed. Right. But in terms of the people who didn't stay, do you have any, any sense of whether uh, they went elsewhere that, but continued, say, the same type of living that they had sought here, or whether they, in essence, went back, joined society, became corporate executives, or whatever? Well, some did, yes. Um, there's a book that preceded mine, and really it, it kind of is what I was working against. It's a book called Back from the Land, and it's the stories of everybody who failed to stay on the land. And all of them, as she said, now are disguised in middle-class lives. And I knew that that wasn't the case in West Virginia for a whole lot of people. But I talked to several people and asked them the question of, you know, why did they think people left? In many cases, it was because one of the couple, one partner of the couple, wanted to stay on the land and was willing to make whatever sacrifice it took, and the other one wasn't. And they said, that's it, I'm out of here. And they divorced and left and went back to, you know, reality in the real world. So, and then there were some artisans who just couldn't make it. They wanted to stay and be an artisan, and their work just didn't ever sell. It was, you know, for what reason or another, and they either left and went somewhere else, or they gave up and went back to the city where life wasn't so hard. And Connie McCauley said that she used to tell them, you know, you don't have to, to completely give up your dream. Just move a little closer to the hard road. Don't make life so difficult on yourself. You know. <laughs> So um, some did, and they survived, but others just said that I've had with being cold in the winter. And when they came, we had some pretty ferocious winters, those 70, 71, 72. They were pretty nasty. And we live someplace where you don't have heat other than a pot-bellied stove. Keith Lottie, who's a potter and a musician, who plays in a group called Holy Cow, who plays at Taylor Books a lot, tells a story of having to sit in the middle of this room by the, by the pot-bellied stove in jackets and several layers and the front of them would get nice and warm but the back would be almost icicle so then they'd have to turn around so they could you know warm up the back and then do it again i mean it was just bitter bitter cold so they just weren't prepared to do that and like like greg said or sandy said i think they came with a very romantic notion and there's a whole chapter in the book about why I think that romantic notion got engendered in kids that age. And uh, maybe Greg will speak to that. Oh, okay. I had a thought about the ones that left. The ones that left are our children, that generation. And they are all now in their 20s and 30s. They're and gone. Some in their 40s. They're gone, but they're not. Where what I have, and it'd be interesting to study that group, that generation, yeah. because what I see with our kids is that they form communities where they live. I've got one in Baltimore, and she has developed this very close community, just like she grew up with. Um, and um, I see a lot of those kids being very influential, both in mm -hmm. the arts and in um, And yet know, there are that. some children who stay um, and Jim Proft, who's a, a woodman, wood, wood furniture maker in Lincoln County, his daughter married his apprentice, and there's a whole new generation that's going to stay on the land and, and make furniture. And um, I think Tom and Connie McCauley's, at least one of their children stayed here. So there are some who stayed as well. 
But I do think it's interesting, and I haven't really thought about that path, yeah. that, that all of our children, I say our, I don't actually have any, but you know, they do, I don't know, um, that all of our children, and that's like 20 kids, yeah. left, but they're, you know, they did leave, and they have a very holistic view where they live, and I will say, when they come home, it's, you know, they come home, and mm -hmm. West Virginia is their home in their heart. Sure. And so, you know, it's, uh, you know. Well, I've always believed that in a lot of um, areas, the pendulum swings. First it swings this way, and then it swings that way. And, you know, you all did this, the kids are definitely going to do that, because they don't want to do what mom and dad did. And I think there's a whole lot of that at play as well. Yes. Yes. Uh, there was a book written somewhere, I, I read part of it, about the children of uh, people that lived in communes, okay? And um, um, what happened, a lot of them became auditors and, you know, dealt with figures, numbers, and, and absolutely left this whole way of life. And our daughter, I still remember, I, I laugh about it because here, here we are, you know, with the long skirts and the, you know, I used to wear the clod hopper shoes with, you know, with the long skirts and our, our hair down to here and everything. And my kid was crazy about dollies and I had to make curtains for her room, you know, that had flowers all over it. And I still remember that we were just teasing her. She was home. We lived on this farm out at Elkins, heated by wood. It was freezing cold. We had to chop the wood out. There was ice all over it sometimes. And she had a sleeping bag. And so we decided this was sort of our generation. Well, she can get up, you know, and get herself to school, get herself to the top of the road. And so she had, we gave her an alarm clock when she was like eight. And um, she got completely dressed in a sleeping bag. <laughs> and we could come in, you know, so we were real sleepy, the old hippies, and we'd see the bum, 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 bum. And it was her because it was freezing cold because the wood didn't bank, didn't bank it or anything. And it was really cold in the morning. But incidentally, she loved Elkins, West Virginia. It is her heart. Okay. I think that's the most heartwarming thing I mean, thing she's in California. Yeah. She lives in California. But her heart place is Elkins. Well, you know, my aunt used to always say that you could always tell in West Virginia because they knew where they were going to be buried. <laughs> <laughs> but um, they, um, they do feel a connection to the state. And whether they do live here or not, I think that's, that connection is very strong. And I think it's, um, you know, it's the values that were instilled in them when they were living here in whatever circumstances. I talked to uh, Connie McCauley about those who left, and she was also telling me that about, I don't know, probably been 10 years ago now, she had a hippie reunion. She and Tom had a hippie reunion at their house, and over 100 of their friends who had been there in some part of the state came back. And they all remembered it quite fondly. Nobody was really bummed out that they'd done it. You know, they thought it was a wonderful thing that they had done, and they wished that they could have survived or succeeded on the land. And many of them left because of one or the other, or the partners decided to take off. So I think it's, um, you know, there's always something nostalgic about it. It, it. And of course, it gains nostalgia in retrospect as well, even though, you know, you all remember it being freezing cold. Now, now it's a funny story to tell. Back then, it was pretty, pretty dire circumstances. Yeah. She gets about this book. She says she's a, 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 uh, an urban Appalachian. And of course, I, I, being a coal captain kid, I know I'm an Appalachian. But she's so emotional about this book. It's an indication of what it meant to her to go out and, and do the research and meet the people and put it in the world. Thank you. Yes. I'm Kitty Kowalski, and uh, uh, my then husband and I uh, were political activists in the 60s in college, and we sort of did the thing of going and 
find in the farm to get away from mm -hmm. uh, whatever, the mainstream back in 1970. But we were, you know, he was raised in a coal camp. And I'm just a tip, well, I'm a city girl. I grew up in the Montrose exit of the interstate. Uh, but uh, we ended up getting very involved with all the people mm -hmm. coming to Rome County. And it was a really great experience. The first uh, meeting of the, uh, the country store, yes, we the food co-op was at our mm -hmm. house. And uh, we just got really involved. Mm -hmm. We were, we were sort of local, so what they would do would be sometimes the police were known to bring us a, a hippie that uh, <laughs> <laughs> of course to stay because they figured they'd be walking at our house. Mm -hmm. So uh, I've interacted with a lot of the people that you've talked about. Uh, and Joe, it's, Joe. it's very sentimental. We didn't last because our marriage went to, you know, to dinner. <laughs> So otherwise, my son still lives in Rain County, and he's the doctor at the uh, clinic mm -hmm. up there. So he always he he is entrenched in Rain County. Yeah. You know, there are a lot of people who got very active. Um, there's a guy named Bob Zacher who lives in Monroe County, and he was very active in stopping a power line going across a whole lot of West Virginia. And uh, was it Billy Jack that was really involved in a lot of the, another member of the farm family, very involved in environmental issues. And Tom and, and Judy Rod, I know you probably see their names in the paper these days because they're real active in the Blackwater Water, Blackwater River and all of that area trying to conserve that. So that streak hasn't died. It's still there, all that activism is still, um, going on right now today. I helped start the Rain Arts and Humanities and was their founding president yeah. back in the 70s. And it's right. still going strong. Yeah. That makes me feel good. That's I good. have anything to do with it except sure. to get it organized and right. off the ground. Right. I thank you all for sharing your stories. That's been a real uh, blessing to me to have you all tell me your stories as well as me tell you yours, right. mine. Thank you all very much. I appreciate it. Right here in the book. They're $23, and I guess take credit cards as well.